Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Fotheringham. I'm the Chief Executive of Ahuri, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest event in our Ahuri Research Webinar Series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all working today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar. And I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters throughout Australia. Now, Ahuri is pleased to be able to offer this research webinar series as a means of keeping you informed of our latest research and to help you engage with research findings from our ongoing program of research at a time when our public face-to-face -face conferences and events programs are, of course, still on hold. And so today will be our ninth instalment in the series. If you're interested in, in any of the previous eight webinars, the recordings are freely available on the Ahuri website. Before we meet today's presenters and I introduce you to the topic for today's webinar, I just want to take a moment to introduce you to Uhuri's revamped COVID-19 Research Hub, which is live on our website now. Uh, we created this hub initially back in March as a platform to, to host relevant news and our own analysis of key policy decisions relating to housing, homelessness and cities in response to the pandemic. Uh, and we commissioned eight projects through the COVID-19 research agenda, eight projects to answer some of the most pressing policy questions. And I'm really pleased to say that the third report from this, from this research round has been published just today, uh, led by a team at Swinburne University. It examines every housing policy intervention undertaken by all governments between March and June of, of this year. So please visit the Hub to see this report and a wealth of other interesting con content relating to COVID-19. Right, before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I also need to provide you with a little bit of instruction on the software and some housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded, so if you need to leave or you're getting distracted by, by other arrangements where you are, or for that matter, if you want to return to it later or forward it on to a colleague, the recording will be available on the Ahuri website in the coming days. At the end of today's webinar, you'll receive a survey. We really do welcome your feedback so that we can refine and improve future webinars to ensure we're presenting information for future to you. Now, in terms of participating in today's webinar, here are some instructions. You're listening by default to your computer speaker systems, um, but if you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-up information will be made available to you. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions by typing them in the question section of the control panel. Um, and you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collate these and, and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A segment following today's presentation. Uh, but do please disregard the raise your hand function as we won't be using that. Uh, now, today's topic and presenters. So I'm delighted to welcome today's uh, welcome you to today's webinar, Energy Affordable Housing Policy Solutions. This webinar was originally scheduled to be hosted on the 15th of October, but had to be postponed due to unforeseen circumstances on the day. So we thank you for your understanding and are really happy to welcome you to the seminar finally today. Um, our presenter today is, is Dr. Lirian Daniel from the University of Adelaide, uh, the lead author of Ahuri's report, Warm, Cool and Energy Affordable Housing Policy Solutions for Low Income Renters, which is the basis for today's webinar. The report presents the findings of an investigative panel that examine the prevalence and experience of energy hardship in its different forms within Australia's rental housing market. The report, along with a policy evidence summary and a standalone executive summary, is available on the Ahuri website, and the address should be on your screen now. It's also available as a download in the handouts uh, segment of the control panel in this webinar. Our speaker, Dr. Lirian Daniel, is a research fellow in the Healthy Cities Research Group at the University of Adelaide. She's interested in hazardous housing and its implications for population health and well-being. Her recent work has focused on Australia's hidden cold housing problem, energy hardship among tenant households and thermal standards for homes. We also welcome Kerry Connors as respondent following Lirian's research presentation. Kerry is currently the Acting Director of Research at Energy Consumers Australia. She's been with ECA since its inception, building on her extensive experience on energy consumer issues, previously as the Executive Director of the Consumer Advocacy Panel, uh, the Inaugural Executive Officer of the Consumer Utilities Advocacy Centre, and she's also worked with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, including a posting with the Australian Embassy in Seoul, and has managed her own consultancy business, strengthening relationships between private and community sectors. So Kerry, we really look forward to hearing your thoughts on the research too. 
But now it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Larry and Daniel. Thank you, Michael. Um, so at this stage, I'd like to take the opportunity as well to acknowledge uh, the, the Ghana people um, whose land that I'm coming um, to you uh, from today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, at this point, it would also be wonderful to thank and acknowledge the uh, wider research team. So we had three universities working on this. There was myself, Emma Baker and Catherine Hamilton from the University of Adelaide, Andrew Beer from University of South Australia, uh, and Travess Moore, Nikki Willen and Ralph Horn from RMIT. A really fantastic bunch to work with. Um, thanks to all of our participants who, who made the research what it is, who participated through focus groups, key informant interviews and the project panel. And finally, thanks to Uhuri for supporting and, and funding the research. So, um, Katarina, if we may go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So the research was, um, as, as Michael um, mentioned before, formulated as an uh, in, um, a hurry investigative panel project um, type of, of research. So really, we were trying to gather together existing research, existing policy around energy hardship, um, energy efficiency, housing conditions within Australia and sort of set the scene and then consider um, perhaps what might uh, what policy responses might be appropriate um, um, to this problem. So really, we identified that energy hardship is a widespread problem in Australia or across Australia, particularly within the rental sector, and, and it's more than likely getting worse. So, so we probably need to um, have a think about how we might respond in terms of, of research and policy. So if we may go to the next slide. Thank you. So when we looked at who was vulnerable or who is vulnerable to energy hardship, this was really, um, you know, taking a, a synthesis of existing research in Australia and, um, you know, both from non-government organisation, government commission research, as, as well as um, sort of more uh, traditional academic research. We really found a wide range of people um, exposed or vulnerable to energy hardship. So this was, um, you know, uh, as we've identified uh, loosely um, by, by the focus area, this is people within the social and private rental sectors, particularly on a low income, but then even more specific, it can be families with children, um, it could be elderly households, it could be people from um, our, our large population of culturally and um, linguistically um, diverse sort of population. It can be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, people um, uh, in, in sort of multi-generational households and, and people living in um, sort of remote and regional areas. So it really covers um, or, or can impact a very wide range of, of people within our community. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Across all of these different groups, we really noticed that in common, the people who were really experiencing energy hardship had these sort of overlapping bundles of problems. So there were issues to do with, um, you know, personal sort of problems or individual problems that people faced, uh, the things um, yeah, so, so things to do with the individual, but then there's also um, uh, issues with the material condition and, and the sort of rights under which people occupy housing. Uh, so these issues particularly came together within the sort of lower cost um, uh, end or the, the lower end of, of the rental sector. So if we may go to the next slide. Uh, so, so some of the personal issues were, of course, um, low income or, or financial resources. It could have been um, existing health or disability or, or new sort of um, acquired uh, health conditions. It could be a lack of familiar supports or social networks um, and, and even just things like simply not having enough 
sort of time and energy to consider um, energy efficiency and, you know, how to get, you know, a better deal on electricity bill because, you know, for some people just covering the real basics is, is taking up, you know, most of the time and energy, um, you know, just, just to provide food and, and basic medication and things like that. Um, so those kind of personal issues then overlapped with housing issues. So this was particularly poor quality housing. So there might not be any insulation, um, you know, gaps around the windows, under doors, really inefficient appliances or, or no fixed sort of heating and cooling appliances at all. So people have to rely on sort of portable, very inefficient appliances. Um, and, and yeah, and just sort of really um, poor quality buildings, but then because they're also rented, um, less uh, opportunity for tenants to actually either request or, or make improvements to their, their housing themselves. Um, so all of these things sort of layer up and combine to, to really make uh, problems of energy hardship, particularly within this sector, quite sticky and quite difficult to address. Uh, so if we may go to the next one, please. So we we sort of thought, okay, well, well, I mean, I guess this is just me being cheeky, but why do we care? You know, this is some pictures that we collected for another project about uh, rental housing conditions, but they really illustrate um, some of the things that can happen to the home when people aren't able to access enough energy to keep it warm and dry, or you know it's um, not sealed properly and it's leaking. So things like condensation on the windows, you can see in that first picture, it's actually a beautiful bright blue um, sunny day, but there's still this condensation on the inside. There's clearly water damage and mould in the second image and we even have a little mushroom fungi toadstool thing growing in a, in a rotted windowsill in the third image. So aside from being you know probably pretty miserable to live in, these kinds of um, um, uh, problems caused by energy hardship and poor housing conditions actually have quite a substantial impact on people's health and well-being. So this can be physical health, mental health. So for example, physical health, it could be, um, you know, exacerbation of asthma from uh, mould spores. It could be, you know, if you're living in a really cold house through winter, um, um, uh, exacerbation of cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Um, mental health, the, the you know, stress and worry about how you might afford the next energy bill. And then, um, you know, I guess as, as is documented uh, more widely in the international literature, uh, you know, things like um, uh, poor educational outcomes for children, um, poor developmental outcomes for children, even nutrition, uh, uh, reduced productivity at work and things like that. So there's really substantial impacts, uh, direct and indirect, from these problems of energy hardship. Turning, um, so there's unfortunately not a lot of um, evidence uh, based on Australian data at the moment. So that's definitely, you know, one thing that we might uh, consider building up an evidence base around this moving forward. Um, but, but one of the um, graphs, oh, sorry, if we may go to the next slide, please, Katarina. Uh, one of the graphs that I wanted to show you was um, from a, a, an adjacent project on um, uh, rental housing conditions that, and we've taken, um, taken receipt of this uh, data set recently and I just found this graph really stunning. So it shows um, people's uh, self-assessed health against the proportion of people that are um, unable to keep warm in winter in their homes. And you can see that people with the poorest health actually have the highest rates or, or highest proportion of being unable to stay warm in their homes. So really, you know, People with a poor health, perhaps we we think we ought to, you know, that they should probably have the best housing to sort of manage those health conditions or protect those health conditions, but they're actually facing the worst. So there's really um, quite clear international evidence, and we're slowly developing um, the evidence base here in Australia as well about the importance of um, this issue and and the you know direct impact people's quality of life um, in Australia. So if we may go to the next slide. 
So we wanted to, I guess, have a look at um, what kind of assistance uh, measures or programs there are at the moment um, for households that might be struggling with their energy. We found um, uh, that there's been things like, you know, replacing inefficient light bulbs with more efficient LEDs, uh, no interest loans or, or subsidising uh, the purchase of more efficient heating and cooling appliances. And then there's fantastic um, energy sort of comparison, contract comparison sites as well provided by governments. But what we found um, that these, and this really was quite reflected in our discussions with um, our project panel and, and people from the industry as well, that these are probably quite light touch. So they might help people who might be vulnerable but have not yet experienced energy hardship. Maybe they provide a little bit of protection right there, but then um, perhaps they don't do enough to stop people tipping into actually experiencing an energy hardship or really trying to pull people out of that disadvantage who have, you know, have really experienced persistent um, energy hardship. Um, this was really uh, apparent in, in one of our key informant interviews um, where the um, the person actually said, you know, often energy hardship for a lot of people is actually experienced in conjunction with a lot of other sort of forms of disadvantage. And, and it's sort of like a long term um, um, uh, sort of persistent problem. So we really think that actually at the moment people like that will need much deeper and sustained assistance and we're probably missing that. Um, at the moment from the policy landscape within Australia. So next slide, please. If we think about um, what potential solutions might look like, um, we've sort of got perhaps three uh, main sort of categories of strategies that we might consider. So we can improve the material conditions of people's homes. This might mean, you know, insulating walls, ceilings, uh, you know, Draft ceiling is incredibly cost effective. Um, so filling up all those little cracks around windows and doors, um, even things like wall vents. So I'm looking up at mine that we've um, done this winter. We finally, I can't hear whistling, um, you know, uh, through the walls in winter. Um, uh, you know, perhaps even double glazing and things like that. So that's sort of, or, or more efficient heating and cooling appliances. So that's uh, one, one set of strategies that we might consider. We might think about increasing uh, people's capacity to pay. So uh, this could be, you know, at a very basic level, increasing income support payments. So people are able to, you know, um, afford basic uh, living costs, uh, like, you know, sufficient energy, food, uh, medication, education, those kind of things. Um, and we could make energy more affordable. So whether this is, is perhaps by subsidising um, or even things like solar panels that um, uh, re reduce that bill a little bit. So if we go to the next slide, please. So among all our discussions, so we brought our project panels together a couple of times and we had really good discussions about, you know, what solutions might look like. And um, they, there were a lot of ideas, uh, but we, we sort of kept on coming back to the idea that there's really no one single magic bullet solution, which, you know, I, I guess um, we, we probably um, know that from a lot of research. There's, very rarely one solution. Um, so we really need a suite of measures because, uh, you know, people, uh, as we sort of touched on at the very start, are quite different in their um, living circumstances, in their personal circumstances, in their housing circumstances. So they really need, and you know, the level of different hardships. So really need different um, interventions to, to target um, different people uh, experience energy hardship. So uh, we, un underneath all of the sort of ideas that we thought about, we kept on coming back to mandatory building standards. So we found that um, really, I think the project panel reached a consensus that this had to be sort of one of the underlying things uh, across um, uh, 
and underneath all other sort of programs and strategies. So at the moment in Australia, uh, we have mandatory building standards for new builds and significant renovations, but these don't really do a lot to um, actually capture and continually improve our existing housing stock. So that's something that we might need to um, um, better consider. How, how do we improve um, the existing housing stock? So uh, in the rental sector, this might look like uh, meeting some kind of minimum standards at the point of lease. So things like um, ensuring there's uh, efficient working heating, um, maybe uh, the building envelope is, is sort of um, some kind of performance standard. Uh, you know, even, even something as basic as making sure that there's not, um, you know, long-term mould problems and things like that within the home. Um, I guess uh, that, that's sort of probably more um, focused on the private sector, but then also within the public sector, we found that a lot of the older housing stock is really quite um, worn and, and probably not quite fit for purpose. So um, sort of uh, uh, in parallel to the developments within the private sector, we probably also need to see quite an investment in the public housing sector in raising the standard of all of that older housing stock um, in that area. So we sort of um, thought about all of these different layers of, of strategies, all these suite of strategies as almost layers of safety nets. So there might be things up the very top that people can access uh, before they even experience energy hardship. Maybe, you know, you're a little bit concerned about all oh, that energy bills a bit high this quarter. There might be things like opt-in, minor retrofit education and advice. So that really just helps people before they even, you know, reach sort of a real sort of risk or vulnerability to sort of tipping over. There might be, um, and then it will sort of go down. So we're really trying to have protections to stop people tipping into the experience of energy hardship and then to also um, bring people up out of it and improve living conditions. One, uh, one thing that I haven't touched on much at the moment is the role of the landlord. We, we found this quite challenging. Um, and, and one of the key ideas for landlord was to um, perhaps consider tax incentives to uh, improve the dwelling. So as well as um, sort of minimum standards, which I guess is a bit of the, um, um, uh, sorry, the carrot and the, the stick, the, the, the minimum standards of the stick, um, you know, Tax incentives could be a carrot as well to, to um, encourage landlords actually to improve the quality of, of the properties that they're offering for rent. Um, it was tricky really to engage with this group, so we need to think about how we can bring um, property owners, property investors into this conversation more. Um, and, and then there's a few other strategies as well, like low or no interest loans for self retrofit and things like that but always there's that sort of tension um, I think for tenants you know how much would you really want to spend if you're going to be leaving in 12 months or two years um, and you know what what changes are you actually able to make to the property uh, so if we go to the next one please so throughout all of these discussions and and perhaps um you know, I've laboured this point early on, but we really um, spoke a lot about the health implications of poor living conditions, um, you know, brought about by energy hardship. So we we really, uh, this the, the project panels really showed us that we need to very clearly try to link housing standards and living conditions to um, health. So bring in health practitioners, um, policy makers within the health space to this discussion and almost think of housing as a health infrastructure. So where we live impacts on our health and wellbeing through many different ways. And we can see these, um, these uh, relationships quite uh, clearly uh, with um, instances of energy hardship, things like cold and heat in homes. So this was uh, a key uh, 
uh, probably finding from this research that we, we really need to try and think about housing in terms of health and really closely link those policies. So um, at the moment, our, um, our national um, construction uh, standard for homes particularly the energy efficiency uh, part of that, doesn't explicitly um, have an objective of supporting health. It might be sort of implied in our discussions, but it's actually um, really just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions from energy use within homes. So that's really important, obviously, but I think we need to actually have this um, really explicit link to supporting occupants' health um, within how we, we formulate standards and we, we think about energy efficiency. So I guess that the, the idea of this um, is really thinking about houses as homes first and um, investment properties second. So um, I think that's perhaps a bit challenging uh, in the current um, climate in Australia where really we see housing as a fantastic investment. But perhaps if we can start to cultivate and nurture this idea a little bit more, we might be a little bit more receptive to, um, you know, community or, or, or social consensus um, of what we think are, um, you know, minimum housing conditions that everybody should have access to. So if we go to the next slide, please. So, so this really quite uh, explicit link between housing conditions and health has been made in other countries. Um, for example, in, in Canada, in New Zealand, in um, the UK. New Zealand's a fantastic example of where there's been an incredibly strong, sustained program of research over many decades, and that's actually um, influenced policy. So, for example, New Zealand have the um, a rental warranty of fitness, which is a checklist, um, I think at the point of lease, that just goes through and makes sure the, the, the dwelling is fit for purpose. Um, and there's similar things in other countries as well. So in Australia, this might be a really fantastic opportunity um, for us to begin discussions around developing some kind of um, sort of universal standard uh, for minimum conditions in both rental and perhaps existing sort of owner occupied properties as well. Um, so I think if we go to the next one, please. I, I guess just in summary, if we if we start to to go down these ways, and oh, I know what I was going to say, um, just that uh, uh, Victoria and Queensland have made some fantastic fantastic projects uh, progress in in coming up with these kind of minimum standards already. So we are seeing movement in this uh, at the state level. We're seeing leadership, particularly from Victoria. But it'll be fantastic to see that um, at national sort of level leadership as well. So perhaps these uh, ideas uh, offer us uh, a way or a few different ways to think about responding to energy hardship, particularly within the um, lower income uh, rental sector, both uh, social and private, and think about improving our uh, living conditions for the people that we um, visited in the first few slides and, and taking care um, of, of all of our sort of community. So thank you. Thanks, Lurian, for that, for that fascinating um, summary of the research. Kerry, I look forward to, to, I guess, your response to who that research, what it means for for the sector, for consumers, and perhaps while while you're talking, Kerry, if if people would like to start composing their questions or, or comments through to us, please feel free to do so through the the questions tab in the control panel. Kerry, hey, thank you, Michael, um, and thanks to Uhuri for inviting ECA to be part of this webinar. Um, I want to begin by congratulating Lirian and her colleagues on the report. Uh, it resonates very much with the with our own research and the work we've been doing around housing. Um, I thought I'd explain first why an energy consumer organisation is treating housing as a priority uh, and, and why we're supporting the recommendations made in the Uhuri research. Um, we came to this issue through our PowerShift project, which aimed to understand how we can help people manage their energy use and bills. Uh, that project 
uh, trialled different types of energy and energy efficiency interventions in 20,000 low income households through the national, built on the data set um, of those pilots through the Low Income Energy Efficiency Program or LEAP. Um, and that analysis underlined just how important housing is. Um, as Lyrian said, you know, replacing small appliances or minor retrofits have no impact at all in very poor quality homes. There's no point improving the energy literacy through uh, consumer education or consumer awareness if your home is leaking heat in winter uh, or leaking cool in summer. And your choices in that situation are, are, are really pretty grim. You either pay a disproportionately high bill um, or go without. And, and going without means that, you know, potentially rationing energy to an unsafe and unhealthy level or you're foregoing other essential goods and services. You know, it wasn't uncommon to find people um, missing meals to be able to pay their energy bills. Um, so we would strongly, strongly endorse the finding that energy efficient housing exacerbates energy hardship. And from our perspective, it, it throws up a real structural barrier to affordable energy, which puts it in our, our wheelhouse. Um, we'd also agree that it's an issue that requires urgent attention. Um, hardship hardship is, is a, an on, has been an ongoing problem in the energy market um, for, uh, you know, for forever. Um, but the impact of COVID and the economic recession means that we're now seeing increasing levels of financial stress and we're seeing new types of customers who are needing help. So that group of, of, of people who are vulnerable to energy hardship is, is increasing. Um, within that group, tenants are particularly vulnerable. Um, Anglicare's latest rental affordability snapshot um, indicated that anybody who's out of work can only afford 1% of the rentals available on the market. So even, you know, there's a level of vulnerability that we need to be very conscious of. Uh, we'd also very strongly support uh, the report's recommendation that we need to reframe this debate. Um, as Lyrian noted, it's, it's an evolving evidence base, but it's increasingly clear that poor quality housing adds to public health costs. Uh, and, it, and, and there is also a, a growing and substantive evidence base about the importance of affordable energy. Well, it's actually, it's, a, it's a, the importance of living in a safe and comfortable home to people's well-being and mental health. So it gives people a sense of greater sense of security, a greater sense of agency when they're able to control their household bills. Um, we think asking decision makers to consider this as a health issue, not only kind of carries greater weight, but it also makes more stark the costs of inaction. So we think that's a very powerful way of thinking about housing as a health issue. Um, I also wanted to just mention this, that there's other drivers of change that we think make action and collaboration more uh, urgent. The energy market's reached a, a pivot point um, what's called the three Ds, which is digitalisation, decentralisation and decarbonisation, are changing the way that all of us are going to be asked to think about and use energy. Uh, digital technologies are going to make it easier for people, should make it easier for people to understand and manage their energy use, um, giving real-time information, allowing people to coordinate appliances to minimise costs and giving people better tools and information to help with their bills. Uh, Decentralisation is the, that growth of appliances that allow us to generate and store energy, not just in our homes, but also in our communities. So that solar panels, batteries, electric vehicles, um, that can also be our hot water systems as a form of storing energy. Um, that means people are now generating, selling and potentially trading energy to each other and to their, within their communities. Um, as I said, that changes the way we use energy. Uh, the other part of the, the other D is decarbonisation. Um, energy is a major source of emissions, which means it's always going to be a focus of climate change responses. There's two implications there in relation to housing. Um, the first is uh, the increasing electrification of housing. Um, the ACT government's already announced a policy to shift people to all electric by 2030 as part of its zero, net zero emissions strategy. Uh, the other aspect is the need to future-proof. So to make sure that housing is appropriate for a climate that's gonna be warmer and with more extreme weather events. 
Um, so for tenants, we need to ensure that they can access the benefits of those transformations because at the moment they, they are, they, they, there's a number of obstacles in their way. Um, we'd also agree very much with the conclusion that there's no silver bullet to this. Um, there's a range of policies and actions that have to be taken on the energy and the housing side and there's a pretty complicated web of Commonwealth and state and territory uh, portfolios and policy levers that need to be the need to come into play to actually achieve those outcomes. Um, there is a process that's being run through COAG energy ministers, uh, the trajectory for low energy homes, that is trying to marshal and coordinate uh, national action within that policy framework. Um, that's a sort of a three year process at the moment looking at existing buildings, uh, but it's a very big piece of work. Um, and I think that um, it's, yeah, we're going to have to work together to, to achieve good outcomes across each of those policy levers. Um, one of the things I thought came out very clearly from the Uhuri research too is that it's not without, within the power of tenants to drive change. And I think our extensive experience in this market shows it's pretty unlikely to be landlords or property agents. So we, we're looking, we are looking to government to lead this debate. Um, not just to model good practice in its own housing, but also to be measuring and sharing the impacts on the residents of that housing to actually keep underlining what good practice is and building to that evidence base. Uh, and the final thing I just wanted to mention quickly is that there are a group of advocates who are working together to support change. Um, the Community Coalition for Healthy and Affordable Homes brings together energy and housing organisations who are working on those issues in the trajectory um, and improving the rental, the energy performance of rental pro of properties is a major priority for that group. So we're very happy yesterday to see the ACT commit to mandate minimum energy efficiency standards for rental properties from next year. Um, that group of advocates is also working with energy regulators to um, think about how changes to energy market designs going forward with the three Ds don't make uh, low in, don't make it any tougher for low income households, including low income tenants. Um, and I might finish there. So congratulations again, Lirian. Thanks, Kerry. Um, a number of good comments and questions coming through and I would encourage um, anyone anyone participating in the webinar to to put through comments and questions um, now before we get too flooded and don't get a chance to get to them. Um, first, this is sort of a, a set of comments um, reflecting on New Zealand's research in this space and, and that, that there has been New Zealand research on, on housing stock quality and its impact on health since the early 2000s, I guess. Um, and in particular, there's sort of the program that's just received major new funding um, led by Philippa Howden Chapman at, at Otago. Um, Lirian, I, I know Adelaide Uni has some some quite quite good connections to to the New Zealand program. Did you want to a talk about that and b perhaps reflect on how they've got so far ahead of us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. Um, I mean, I, I don't know the very uh, you know beginnings of the history of that group, but they've done some amazing work and really the whole way through worked so closely um, with policymakers and really made it sort of, um, I guess, a social issue as well. Like uh, some of the research looks at, for example, um, uh, improving children's asthma conditions by I think it was um, either insulin insulation or, or um, giving a more efficient heater device to a, a range of households. So, you know, when you have this national discussion about children's health and that's tied to, um, you know, housing standards, how could you say no to children's health? It's like, of course we should, um, you know, we should be protecting, you know, people that are more vulnerable within the community by making sure living environments are supportive of, of health and wellbeing. So I think that's a wonderful thing that um, the New Zealand researchers have really been able to do. They really have um, led this space incredibly. I think in Australia, perhaps um, we're a little bit behind because we've always, um, you know, we've probably considered ourselves as um, 
you know, a lucky country in terms of housing and, and you know, we've had a fairly good housing stock, but it, it sort of has deteriorated and perhaps, you know, we've just been a little bit complacent and not really realised the extent of issues within this country. So, um, some of our work also looks at cold within housing and, and you know, uh, our sort of um, our introduction to this is, you know, in Australia, we think of ourselves as a very mild climate or even a, a hot climate. But actually, most of the population live in um, climate zones where it takes more energy to keep us warm in winter than cool in summer. So we actually have sort of these problems that we've not quite recognised so much because our climate is, is relatively um, mild compared to New Zealand or, or UK or, or other countries like that. So um, I think it's sort of coming to a point where we're actually taking a lot more notice of these things um, and, and really sort of seeing the impact. And, and hopefully, um, you know, we um, gaining a lot of momentum uh, with research uh, response. I think a fantastic thing that's happened recently is that um, uh, Professor Rebecca Bentley and Professor Emma Baker have um, been successful in obtaining funding for a Centre of Research, research Excellence um, for Healthy Housing and that's led out of University of Melbourne and that really provides um, sort of five years funding, um, you know, a sustained effort to start um, bringing up the Australian evidence base uh, in this area. So hopefully, um, you know, and there's fantastic input from people like Philippa Howard Chapman and, and other international experts in this space. So hopefully, you know, Australia um, will certainly research wise um, join, you know, very quickly. And then hopefully we can really um, create that uh, policy um, uh, uh, momentum or, or, or um, uh, yeah, the policy drive as well. Mm. Thanks, Lou. Kerry, New Zealand makes an interesting comparison to us in, in many ways. Is there a different advocacy role there or is, do you have a sense of, of perhaps where things have moved differently there? I, I, I It has been a different path. Um, I'm, I'm just reminded of a what a story that might be apocryphal that I was told in about 2004 by uh, an Australian government official who'd visited New Zealand, who had been told by one of his colleagues that uh, they used to measure the level at when disconnections went up by the number of house fires that had increased because people were using candles inside. So it, it's been, I think, a, a, a very light touch regulatory framework on the energy side. Um, which I think might have meant that, you know, finding different ways to frame the debate and coming at it from a health perspective was the more powerful argument. Um, but I think also they they realised too, I mean, you know, the climate in New Zealand is obviously one where, um, you know, if you don't hit your home in winter, you know, it's very easy to die. I think that uh, in Australia, we've underplayed that impact, haven't we? I think we assume that that people don't die from cold, whereas in Sydney they do, um, uh, and they do it at a higher rate than Stockholm. If one studies to be, you know, one one studies claimed. So, um, I think we've come late to uh, making that linkage between energy and housing. Uh, it's been complicated by the um, governance framework, you know, that. Um, housing is very much a jurisdictional issue. Energy is a sort of, is more of a federated set of governance arrangements. Um, and uh, those parts of government haven't talked to each other as well, perhaps as you would have liked to have seen. I think that's changing. As I said, there was more, we are seeing a real opportunity for change. I, I must say, having worked, I've worked in energy advocacy, for um, you know, nearly 20 years. And from about three or four years ago, I've never heard people talk about housing as much as, as they have. So there's a real acknowledgement, I think, within the sector of the need for change. Um, and, and as I said, all of those uh, future, the way the, uh, the future direction means that we need to change. 
Um, New Zealand, I think, has been, um, yeah, taken a different pathway for different mm. reasons. Kind of come to the some come to the same landing. Interesting. Uh, what has been very strong, I think, in New Zealand is it's been very much evidence driven. You know, I think that's that's been a very um, getting very uh, strong clinical level evidence has been very persuasive. Mm. The UK is also an interesting sort of comparison as well. So there it's sort of quite a political issue. So, for example, um, each year statistics on excess deaths related to fuel poverty are published. It becomes sort of an outrage and, um, you know, it, it's centred around, um, I believe, sometimes um, elderly people and, and older voters. So it really becomes a political issue and that's driven a lot as well. So it, it's quite interesting to see how the different um, countries have, have sort of um, yeah, arriving at a similar sort of point. Mm. Louis, and this this will probably seem like a, a Dorothy Dixon, but it's it's genuinely a question coming through. Yeah. Um, so, how how fit for purpose is the current data on energy efficiency of Australian dwelling stock? The current data. It, we, <laughs> there's really not very much at all. So this is this is a pet, um, pet area of the research team that I work with. So um, for example, the ABS used to do a housing survey, but the last time they ran it was in 1999. So that provided a nice snapshot of, you know, the quality of people's homes across Australia. And we've really not had any comparable survey since then until 2016, where um, Emma Baker led uh, the first sort of Australian housing conditions data set survey um, to across Victoria, South Australia and New South Wales to really try and establish a methodology for um, repeatedly and systematically collecting information on um, housing, including energy efficiency characteristics. So this year, um, I mentioned in the presentation, we've just taken um, taken receipt of the latest data set in that series, the Australian uh, Rental Housing Conditions data set. And that's really uh, that 15,000 households uh, and information about their, their housing conditions. So I guess we have probably been quite limited in some of the work that we can do or the conclusions that we can come up with because uh, we don't have this type of information on people's housing conditions, let alone the energy efficiency of homes. We really don't know very much about, you know, what's inside people's homes. And this is, you know, all, all sorts of reasons, privacy and um, uh, the cost of data collection. Um, and, you know, that has just not really been a very strong issue as well before. So I think we're starting to see um, some really great efforts in terms of data collection, but I just hope that that's sustained because without that data, it, it really limits us in, um, you know, the our ability to make robust sort of conclusions about the prevalence of this problem, you know, the people impacted, um, and, you know, then thinking about, you know, how we might respond. And I think that would be, um, uh, no, and I'd, I'd agree wholeheartedly that, uh, our, you know, the quality of data is, is poor, it's improving and it's on the way, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very underdone. And, and that's had a, um, uh, that throws up its own obstacle because it becomes difficult then for governments to quantify what the costs of change are. So, mm -hmm. you know, how, what the, and, and to, to undertake any sort of cost benefit analysis um, easily that might actually um, help. That's different and that we are different there from the UK. The UK has very good quality housing, uh, so has very good housing quality data um, given most of mm -hmm. the properties the council owns. So, that, that's a big change. Um, the other, I mean, one of the secondary benefits of mandating um, uh, disclosure of energy efficiency ratings on when when you rent or buy a property um, would actually be that it would add to that evidence base that we'd have a much better picture of what's in, of what, you know, that quality of housing is like and get a better picture of that nationally as well, given 
Um, again, you know, there is a um, there are houses that have been built in Queensland that more properly belong in Victoria. So, and there's yeah. quite a bit of interest in in the the comments and questions around, I guess, state level initiatives that we'll come to in a moment. But um, I might just first pick up on a, on a point of clarification, I guess, or, or looking to unpack one of the comments you made about the crossover between energy hardship um, and addressing that and addressing greenhouse gas emission and, and whether or not the same responses serve both ends um, or whether there are perhaps competing demands there. Um, uh, perhaps Gary, if I can start and then if you <laughs> uh, put your two cents in as well, but I would say, um, Probably it's been a little bit tricky because we've had these um, objectives. Um, they've probably been quite conflated in our discussions of, of housing and things like that. So um, probably a lot of our housing standards have come from the objective of reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and more sustainable built environment. Um, and it, health has come in more recently in sort of the far sorry, pardon me, past five to 10 years. Um, but in fact, the strategies are not necessarily the same. So to relieve energy hardship, you might make energy cheaper. So people use, you know, have the capacity to use it more and, and turn on their heater and have a nice, you know, safe, warm or safe, cool living environment. But of course, it has implications for greenhouse gas emissions from energy use. So I think certainly there might be strategies that um, meet both objectives. But I think we also need to be very clear about um, which objective we're prioritising with which strategy. And, and I guess um, also that those um, there's not unintended consequences by not considering that clearly and, and sort of separating that out because otherwise we might just be undoing all the good work that we're, we're doing in another sort of sector so um, I think yeah. I, no I, I think I'd agree I think um, there's been uh, a lot of energy efficiency programs and, uh, and trials that have been run that look as though they've failed because they've they haven't resulted in long-term reduced emissions. Um, but what they have done is improve the health and well-being of the people who live in that house. They have in, um, they have uh, given them the capacity to manage their bills. And for those people, maybe managing their bills does mean that they're using a little bit more energy. Um, so, uh, but as I said, there's been programs that have sort of been dismissed as failures because they haven't achieved, you know, one part of the target. Um, the work we did in PowerShift would certainly indicate that the public health benefits of energy efficiency and helping people, um, you know, giving people better control actually outweigh, probably outweigh the savings in uh, energy bills and emissions. Um, that when you know, if when you look in a cost-benefit analysis, if you actually are able to factor in and quantify those costs, you come out with a much stronger business case. And and we developed a tool for policymakers, our multiple impacts framework, uh, to try and help people make that case to understand where the evidence base was robust, where there's more work to be done, and and how to quantify that. Um, they don't necessarily. I don't think they have to compete they should be able to be rolled out in a complementary way um, as i said you know uh, if we think about um, the us runs out a whole series of programs through uh, that are federally funded that are just sort of under the banner of weatherization so to help people actually you know keep their house warm in winter um, you know we haven't tended to think of energy efficiency programs like that We've thought about them in terms of bills or emissions, but um, part of a climate change response, as I said, has to be actually making sure that homes can sustain and, and um, uh, people can live safely in homes in different types of weather that we're going to. So um, I, I think Larian's right. You have to be very clear on the objective of the program and what you're trying to target, but uh, I, I don't, think they necessarily have to compete at all. 
Thank you. Um, there's an interesting, I guess, detailed question on the on the research. Did you look at occupancy rates or, or sort of whether overcrowding plays a role in, in this or for that matter, underutilisation at the other end of the scale? There was some really interesting, so this is sort of more just anecdotal stuff from our project panel meetings, but there were really interesting, well, sorry, interesting, I, I guess sort of sad stories about um, one gentleman shared a story about a family with, um, it was a single mother with, um, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, maybe three or four uh, sort of school age and older children. And she had a lot of trouble um, controlling energy bills simply because the teenagers would just put the heating up and, you know, she had limited capacity to actually control energy use within the home. Um, so there's that kind of occupancy story where um, that, and, and I think that actually came as quite a surprise to me, or it was an aspect that I hadn't really considered before that, that, you know, there are, if there's multiple or lots of people living in a home, it's really hard to actually say, oh, no, no, um, you know, we need to turn the heating off or, or, you know, we can't plug in all of that devices or actually we need to switch the lights off a little bit more often. Um, and, and I guess, um, like, you can see how that would be particularly problematic in share houses as well. But the other thing on occupancy was we do see a lot of problems with lone person households. Um, and, and perhaps some of that comes down to um, uh, one, perhaps having a very, very low or no income just because there's only one of you. Um, and also that sort of stoicism of like, oh, no, I just put, you know, three more jumpers on and I'll sit on the couch with um, with an electric blanket or a hot water bottle um, or I'll stay in bed a bit longer or I might just go to the supermarket in summer to, to stay a bit cooler. So I think when it's one person, there's not that sort of impetus to um, to improve conditions, perhaps for the care of other members of your household, um, um, and, and more of a stoicism about toughing it out uh, your, yourself, perhaps. So, um, yeah, there, there's definitely occupancy issues. We weren't able to quantify them in any substantial way, but definitely, um, uh, yeah. Other other stories were um, the dwelling not really being fit for for. So this was in terms of public housing, actually, um, a story from one of our project panel members, uh, where people were um, uh, housed in quite large three or four bedroom uh, dwellings in suburbs, uh, sort of outer suburbs, and, and actually that dwelling was probably a bit too big for their needs, um, and it was really hard for them to sort of zone off areas to heat and cool more efficiently. So I think it doesn't, it, it does warrant sort of um, uh, further examination, absolutely. We might have just lost Kerry there, I'm not sure. Yep, I think her connection has just dropped out, but we'll, we'll wait for her to come back in a moment. In yeah. the meantime, look, uh, some, some interesting work around um, low-income older um, older adults and their ability to access you know, better deals, you know, in the, with the digitisation of the energy market and how that plays yeah. out. Is this something that you've looked at as well? Yeah, it's it's really tough. And I think it's not only with um, older people, though definitely there's additional barriers there, but all of these things are really complex. Like, um, I have to admit, even I, you know, with some, some knowledge of this area, find um, all of the different government um, programs and, and websites and, you know, negotiating with retailers, I find it uh, difficult. So, um, you know, number one, you have to have the time uh, to be able to dedicate to to doing the research and and trying to work out what's going on, um, and then the understanding of yeah the technology I guess so being able to call or look on the internet um, for different deals, um, and then just I guess the personal sort of um, energy and capacity to actually sort of ask ask for that or or ask for better deal. So I think um, for a lot of people. I guess that's why we keep coming back to things like minimum standards is because I don't think it's enough to for people to have to um, 
use their own agency, I guess, to, to improve their living environments. Because I think for some people, unfortunately, there's so many things going on that this is just simply not an option. So I think for some people who, who do have that time and space and, and interest and, um, uh, you know, assertiveness in, in, in doing the research and phoning around and, and things like that, that's fantastic. But we also need a basic level of sort of protection for people that aren't able to necessarily do that at, you know, whatever point in their lives um, as, as well. So I think I think that's why I, I push so hard on minimum standards is because I do see that as providing sort of a basic level um, of protection for people. Mm. Kerry, I think you're back on audio at the moment. I am. I'm back on the phone. I'm terribly sorry. I just ran into the blue screen of death. It was a little bit, oh. yes, odd. I don't know We've what happened. We've all experienced there. this. You know, this is this is part of the unique challenges of 2020 is 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 navigating a you know video conferencing software that we're all sort of become very familiar with very quickly. But um, <laughs> look, we've got your voice for the moment. That's that's. That's certainly useful, and, and I guess just to sort of bring you up to speed, while while you're offline, we've been talking about um, well, a question reflected particularly on on older low income Australians and the digitisation of the market and ability to sort of navigate a really complex energy market. Um, is that is that a space that you're working in at the moment, sort of helping with energy literacy, I guess? No, it, it absolutely is. One of the um, uh, features of our research is, uh, through PowerShift was just to unpack the diversity of customers. So there are, um, it, it became very clear both within low income households that, that different types of customers need different types of approaches and different types of assistance. Um, but, and then within, um, the, uh, the community more broadly that you know there's a need to tailor people ta sorry tailor assistance information and tools to people that fit their lifestyles people with young children you know don't necessarily um, you know could quite welcome a, a website that they can use after the children have gone to bed um, a tenant uh, in a, somebody in a shared house, might like a paper bill that they can, you know, put on the front of the fridge to make sure that everybody understands what the costs are. Um, an older person might actually like somebody coming to the, um, talking them through how they can uh, help manage their bills um, or what sort of things they can do in the house to reduce their bills. Um, we've been, um, our, our uh, one of our, uh, mantras at the moment is designed for diversity, that we have to um, accommodate those different types of customers and understand that, you know, there isn't any more, you know, that, that, that one website or one brochure or, you know, one fact sheet with your bill just isn't going to do it anymore, um, that both energy retailers and governments need to offer a variety of tools across a variety of channels if they really want to offer substantive assistance. Thanks, Kerry. Um, there, are, there are, I guess, a range of comments coming through, coming through that are that are not uniform in perspective. I guess is is, is a polite way to put it. Um, talking about government programs in particular states, and I guess. You know, the, the two states that are perhaps reflected most in the comments are, are Queensland and Victoria. Um, and look, there's some commentary around the Queensland election and, and how much this was or was not um, a key topic. But but also, you know, the role of regulation in different states. And and, um, and in terms of Victoria, you know, some questions about well, what what is it, you know, you, you mentioned that Victoria was one of the leading jurisdictions in this space. Um, and, you know, what does that look like? Um, so, Lirian, would you like to sort of unpack that a little? Mm, um, I think Victoria have led, um, I mean, traditionally uh, in terms of energy efficiency, I think they've really led the way in that as well in, in um, minimum standards and, and bringing them up. 
Um, in this space, uh, there's incredibly strong advocacy and a really engaged um, policy community, I would say, as well. A lot of our project panel members were from Victoria and we really had a fantastic um, sort of network through uh, different organisations and government in Victoria as well. So I guess it looks like um, mandating uh, minimum uh, uh, minimum housing standards for rental homes. So some of the things that we discussed were ensuring that there is um, a fixed heater in, in the home at, at the point of lease and, and things like that. So it wasn't, um, I think it wasn't just focused on um, energy efficiency. It also had um, things like uh, tenure security and, and, you know, pets has been a really big issue as well. So um, I think, yeah, Victoria certainly leading there. I, I guess it would be probably, um, so, so like the National Construction Code, I, I do wonder if national leadership would really help to um, sort of ensure a basic level of consistency across all of the states and, and, and territories in terms of this kind of thing. There's some, um, some that are way out in head, some that are way behind as well, or, or some, you know, there's there's actually standards in place, but they're not um, enforced or, or, you know, weekly regulated. So, um, yeah, I think. Kerry, I'm going to slightly paraphrase a question that's come through for for you. Uh, look, if if you could if you could have one thing from governments across the country at the moment. There's one thing they could be doing that they're not doing at the moment. What would it be? For low income tenants? Well, no, more broadly for, for housing and, broadly. And, and energy. Yeah, yep, your, your um, number one wish list item. <laughs> um, I think, um, I, actually, I, th I think mandating um, energy efficiency you know, the, mandating the disclosure of energy efficiency ratings of housing on rental or purchase. Um, and can I have two? I want two. <laughs> because yeah, I think man. they're coupled. I think putting in place um, uh, a series of, uh, you know, in the UK, uh, what they did was mandate minimum standards. You know, a rental property couldn't be rented out. Uh, if it didn't achieve a certain standard, you had to, um, uh, and they gave people a trajectory and a timeline and a series of grants to support that. So if you were a, you know, um, a, a mum and dad investor, you could access a government grant that could help you achieve, you know, to get to that energy efficiency, but at a certain date, you're not allowed to rent it out if it doesn't get to that rating. So I think that would be the two of those together. It's sort of mandatory disclosure, but sort of a, a good assistance to help people get there. I think that's actually, um, Kerry, a really good point um, um, within that second point that we really need, or, or we kept hearing um, calls for uh, the need for a long-term plan so people can actually plan, um, you know, th they know what is going to happen, they know when, they know what's required of them. So this might be landlords, this might be community housing providers um, or even um, public housing authorities. But I think there, there really does, um, even the construction industry, like there being a really clear um, plan uh, about what's going to happen when and the supports available. So I think probably we've not had um, perhaps that long term vision uh, yet in Australia, maybe, um, or, or it's been, you know, slightly, um, I don't know, restricted. But I think that would be a fantastic opportunity as well to, to look long term and, and, you know, maybe as part of that, we need to make this a, an issue for everybody. Um, I, I think know, that, that yeah, I, I think that's exactly right because I think what it does is it it um, it serves a number of purposes, but one of the most powerful ones, which we've seen in the UK and we've seen in Germany and we've seen in other countries, is that it also incentivizes people to build to the next level. 
because mm -hmm. they know that it's that the standards going to lift. So if well, I may as well build to the level above rather than the minimum standard now. Um, at the moment, we seem to have a situation, particularly with new buildings, where uh, our uh, you know, the, 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 um, the standard is seen as sort of the ceiling, not the floor. So yeah, you know, they're not building above it, they're just trying yeah. to reach it. We, we had a, um, a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago through um, Melvin Uni and one of the guests was uh, Lucy Telfer Barnard from the research group in New Zealand and she had a really um, interesting thing and it just kind of like a, changed my mindset completely that the minimum standards are really the worst house you can legally build. Whereas yes. in Australia, we see the minimum standards, we go, oh, six stars, that's fantastic. Like, that's wonderful. Yes. But actually, no, that's just the, the worst house you can build at the moment. So I think there's this really mindset that, you know, um, housing standards are punitive and unnecessary and, um, you know, restrictive, but, you know, I think they do serve a purpose. So I guess there's so much about changing mindset as well. I, I think that's right, Lirian, and I think it also ties to that, um, that the point you made earlier that we have to stop, you know, we, we, we need to start, uh, you know, making sure that when we talk about rental properties, that we're actually talking mm -hmm. about um, homes, you know, there's mm -hmm. no such thing as an investment property, it's actually a home. So, you know, that, and, and as the owner of somebody else's home, you maybe have some obligations to make sure that that home is safe and healthy as well. Mm -hmm. And that's not an unreasonable thing to have an obligation about. So, yeah, I, no, I think you're right. That's part of the reframing is, is goes to that, that, you know, the, the, the minimum is the, is the worst. I, I like that way of saying it. Isn't it? It really changes the mindset. And yeah. again, going from the UK, you know, landlords and um, property agents actually have a responsibility, like a legal responsibility to ensure that the, the homes are some kind of. So, you know, I, I guess um, people have a right to buy investment properties, but perhaps we also need to reconsider that those responsibilities are a little bit um uh, stronger as well, I guess. I think so. I, and I think Australia is a little bit unusual in that we have a lot of people, a lot of mum and dad landlords. Um, and so mm -hmm. the policy solutions to help that, to help those um, landlords move and, and to see change in that sector, I think probably, uh, you know, do have to recognise that, that they might not have tons of excess capital themselves and particularly now. So again, mm. there might be a role for grants or low interest loans or no interest loans to help people make those improvements to the properties now, rather than, you know, have to wait until um, they can afford to. Mm. Uh, this is this thread of conversation has stirred up all kinds of comments. Um, <laughs> and look, I guess just on that last point, Kerry, just, just before you made that comment, um, one of the one of the um, comments coming through was that the standards in the UK and Germany are aiming higher because they're for a build to market sector um, or, or targeted towards a build to market sector rather than just a build to sell, you know, towards individual mum and dad investors that, that we tend to, to be characterised as. Um, mm. several, com several comments as you were both speaking, strongly endorsing what you were saying, many exclamation marks and yeses. <laughs> um, but look, some, some interesting comments as well. So, you know, one, one here saying that it would be excellent if if disclosure of, of, of you know, the, the dwelling property of, of the conditions in terms of energy efficiency were, were disclosed at rental advertising, um, you know, whether it's in ceiling insulation or double glazing or, or what have you, as it puts a value on it both for the landlord and for the tenant. So there's, there's you know, mm -hmm open information for others. Um, some suggestions that perhaps the real estate sector would have concerns about that approach. I'm not sure that's true. Kerry, what's your thought on that? Well, it, it is a system that's in place um, in the in the ACT on point of sale. You have to give mm. an energy, you have to give a, a disclose the energy efficiency of the property. It's a factor in people's decision. It's not as with any, you know, property is not going to be the only consideration, but it does, um, and, and there has been uh, some research done by Georgia Warren Myers at the University of Melbourne that indicates that lower, lower rated properties are harder to sell um, and that real estate agents, you know, they don't, it's not necessarily, a, a, from what I understand, 
you know, the strongest selling point, but it does become a point at, you know, which they can, they can advertise it. Um, rental properties aren't in the same category. So um, that's a little bit untested, but I think um, once you have a bit like the star ratings on appliances, where, you know, when you go into a, um, the good guys and the salesmen can say, we'll buy this one because it'll cost you less to run, it becomes a selling point. You know, there'd be no reason why mm. real estate agents couldn't be making the same argument. Mm. I, I think it's interesting. Um, I think it's a really useful tool, sort of mandatory disclosure, um, both for sale and for lease. But I also wonder, and, and um, you know, I think more research is needed here, but how the competitiveness of the market um, you know, we heard from people um, in New South Wales tenant advocacy organisations that, you know, people are just, um, you know, choosing, like applying for many different houses and just taking the one that's actually offered to them. So there's actually not a good level of choice within certain um, segments of, of the lower um, cost rental market at the moment. So I'm not sure um, how that becomes a factor or, or, or that evolves with mandatory disclosure as well no i think i think that's absolutely right i think we're uh, and that goes to the minimum standards i, I think mm -hmm. um you, you almost have to couple the two because i think minimum standards for rental properties um is is you need to drive the bar across the sector mm -hmm. at the same time it has to be a, a, a simultaneous uh, sorry it has to be a um a whole action because otherwise um, there is a real danger that costs get passed through to those tenants and and you know that that was reflected in your report and I've seen it in other research and I've certainly heard it myself where you know low-income tenants are they're not going to ask for improvements because they're worried that's going to drive their costs up or yeah. they're going to be seen as a problem um, we yeah. need to there's a power imbalance there that needs to be recognized in the design of those policy solutions and programs Mm, and mm. you know, when we had a chance, we 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 found it fairly difficult to engage with um, sort of landlords and property investors. But when we did have a chance to speak to some, um, yeah, it was really it was quite clear that okay, well, you know, maybe I'd put in an air conditioner because then I can charge more for the property because it, tenants can see that and they can see the benefit. But I'm not going to put in insulation because you can't see that and you can't charge more. Um, for rent. So, um, you know, it, it was quite upfront that this is a sort of financial um, arrangement as well. Yeah. 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 And, and look, it's not uh, understanding the thermal performance of a home in Australia's different climate zones is not an uncomplicated task. Um, and there is some work, there's a report that was recently released by um, the Commonwealth Department, which was looking at some of the, you know, different ways that's done in other jurisdictions overseas. Um, but, you know, and, and each of them has, you know, pros and cons. Um, but it is, uh, it, it seems to be a, a powerful way to drive change mm. at a time when we need change. Fascinating watching comments flow through as you're speaking that are that are echoing the comments or, or slightly anticipating the comments you're both making. <laughs> uh, so there seems to be a, a very attuned audience for, for this session. One of, the, one of the comments I hadn't picked up on just over the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes was was around energy disclosure for sale and lease and and the RBMD or the, the residential building mandatory disclosure process. So for energy disclosure. Um, that that was agreed to by all states and territories in 2009, um, but doesn't seem to have been enacted. Is that is that the case, or have um, I misunderstood that, Kerry? I'm or probably a little bit um, removed from that bit at the moment, but I do remember mandatory disclosure has been um, a national discussion for a long time, but it, it mm. faces various challenges, and I think that's where the states providing little case studies and then finally maybe nationally um, we catch up but um, there is a really strong um, industry body uh, in Australia that 
would prefer fewer uh, regulations in this area. And I think we've probably seen that with the updates of the National Construction Code energy efficiency provisions, that they've really been sort of um, pushed out to a longer time frame and, and things like that. So, I mean, maybe Kerry, you're, you you um, had a place to comment on that. Um, I'm, I look, and I'm not aware of the detail of that, but I think the, the two comments um, I, I would make is that uh, that this is uh, in driving action. The policy levers for for change do sit um, on rental properties um, and on new build and on building standards sit mostly within the jurisdictions. Um, so enforcement and compliance of those standards, I think, is jurisdictional. The, um, there's mm -hmm. an agreement to set national standards for new buildings through the uh, National Construction Code, but it is a sort of a federal agreement that, that everybody must come to the table on. So, um, and, and the trajectory process, which I mentioned, which is, um, you know, an effort to, to create a national dis discourse around these issues within each of the COAG governments, um, doesn't really have the power to mandate action, it's up, but it, it's asking for people to sign on to um, an objective or a set of principles and then to report back to the group on that. So uh, that might have been a, a, an agreement that just sort of wasn't enforced. Um, but I would, I, I would also um, echo what Lirian said about, um, you know, that this isn't in, um, a, a unanimous uh, agreement around this that industry is uh, uh, concerned about the changes and how that affects their costs and their um, capacity. Um, the trajectory is also looking at a way of how you can help industry adapt to that, uh, which is um, seems a, a sensible way to do it. And we were a bit disappointed to see the Master Builders Association came out um, recently with a statement that seemed to be pushing back against improving energy efficiency standards in new houses and seeing that as a special interest ask because um, that's not the, we, we would certainly not see that. Um, as I said, we'd see that as, as creating a healthy and safe home. So uh, it, it is something where industry isn't as far along this journey as perhaps some of, as, as we are, I think. So look, there are a number of other questions, I guess, in that in that thread. But I, in the time remaining, I think it's probably sensible for us to turn to to one of the other themes that's coming through, which is, I guess, building back better. How we respond in in a, in a sort of post-COVID um, world, and you know, to what extent do you anticipate programs from government that are that are focused on energy efficiency in housing as part of stimulus? To, toward recovery. Kerry, do you have a, a sense of that being on the agenda? Um, it, we're trying to get it on the agenda. Uh, the coalition put forward a statement um, pointing out the benefits of um, improving the energy efficiency of, of existing and new homes as an economic stimulus measure and put out a statement um, a few just prior to the Commonwealth budget. Um, it's something we're going to keep talking about, certainly, because it would seem to us that if you were providing any um, stimulus to the building industry, you know, this this is a this would be a measure that would have multiple benefits. So um, yeah, there there is there there are people working on it, and and ACOS um, and a group of other advocates have been working on it very actively. Mm. I think across housing, housing and urban researchers, you know, it's such a loud and vocal call to say, come on, let's like, this is a fantastic opportunity to build social housing. This is a fantastic opportunity to have a, you know, widespread retrofit scheme. Um, we could see it as an opportunity. I'm not sure if, if it's, 
if we're going to see it that way, unfortunately, you know, seeing the large um, grants for um, a sort of owner occupied housing retrofits, like, gosh, that the criteria to even get that, you have to be, um, you know, have, have to have a quite a lot of wealth and then sort of a lower income. So it's sort of like, you know, retirees and that kind of thing who might want to renovate um, their house or put a new kitchen in. Um, but, but what if instead we redirected those resources to, to simple things like, I, I know it's controversial, but, you know, ceiling insulation and weatherization, it, it really, it does seem like there's a fantastic opportunity to come out for this that, that maybe um, ho hopefully we won't miss and hopefully all the voices from Housing um, Research Committee and, and um, organisations like ANCOS and um, um, Energy Consumers Australia are loud enough. I guess I guess that's that's one of the the themes here coming through is is you know to what extent should any stimulus package, whether it's by a, a state or a, or a Commonwealth government, or for that matter even local government, um, you know to what extent should that be focused on new build or on retrofitting and an improvement of of existing stock, and 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 how do you find the balance there? Um, I can jump in. I think. Yep. Oh, would you like to go? You go first. No, no, I was. A, no, that's fine, Lillian. You go first. Okay. Um, I think you know, new build. We do have um, those protections around um, you know minimum housing uh, standards and energy efficiency from the National Construction Code. So I think my ideal, and you know. It's a small proportion of the housing stock that's a new build every year. So um, I, I would say, you know existing housing stock would be a fantastic opportunity um, at this stage. And that's probably where we see perhaps the bulk of um, the, the renters uh, and people sort of um, perhaps at the lower income or, or lower, you know, ability to initiate uh, these kind of improvements themselves. Uh, so I think there's, yeah, I think probably um, existing housing stock would be fantastic for, I guess, um, uh, you know, households themselves. I'm not sure, so sure about um, stimulus. I'm not, um, yeah, I couldn't comment on that, but I think that's an opportunity to to improve conditions for households, certainly. Um, I, no, I think probably I'd agree. I think existing buildings is where we're seeing the greatest detriment So um, to, to households. So, so it would make sense that that was the priority. Um, uh, you know, one of the benefits of that is that tends to then support um, local industries, you know, local community industries mm -hmm. to deliver those retrofits and those services. Um, so we think that, uh, and, and so that would seem to be, uh, you know, it's it, it, a sensible place to start. Um, the, yeah, so no, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think the new building, um, mm -hmm. There are, I mean, there's a commonality of, of change that's going to happen across the building sector, the construction sector to, to you know, again, there's changes that's required to the, the way they build, to the materials they use um, that probably sit in both new and existing. But again, that would just seem another reason to be able to to um, think about this as a means of stimulus to help mm. that industry make that transition. Terrific. Look, we've we've reached the end of our of our time slot um, for the, for this webinar, um, and I want to thank Lyrian and Kerry for for being available to speak today, um, for the terrific insights, Kerry, for your navigating the technology <laughs> even through <laughs> through a I'm collapsing sorry about computer. That. <laughs> no, 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 no. I appreciate your 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 ability to, to resolve it and, and get through by phone. Um, look, I also want to thank everyone who, who's been, been watching and listening today for and for your contributions. The, the discussion thread coming through has been terrific and has really enriched the discussion. Um, our mm -hmm. next webinar is coming up just next week um, and the official invitation will arrive in your inbox shortly. Um, so, so please do join me on, on Friday, Friday the 13th um, of November um, at 12 noon where we'll be joined by Professor Stephen Rowley of Curtin University, who will present findings from the Uhuru Project responding to the pandemic and building homes rebuild Australia. Um, and Associate Professor Chris Mason of Swinburne University, who will present findings from, from the other Uhuru COVID Project looking at policy coordination and housing outcomes during COVID-19. 
which is the report that was published this morning. Um, we'll be joined by Kath Hart, the Regional Executive Director um, of the Housing Industry Association um, from Western Australia, who will be responding to, to these research pieces and, and their impacts for the sector. So that webinar is coming up very soon, just tomorrow week, um, and please do book in quickly. Look, in fact, we're going to be hosting webinars weekly until the end of 2020 in an effort to present you with an extraordinary breadth of, of Uhuru research that's coming through. Um, bolstered by the projects associated with our special COVID research agenda. Um, I should also remind you that the 2020 National Homelessness Conference is coming up to be held online on the 1st and 2nd of December. Of course, this is the conference that was due to be held in Canberra back in August and had to be shelved due to coronavirus. Um, so the, the now digital conference, the online conference, will adopt the theme, The Year That Changed Homelessness. Um, and we'll be examining how the pandemic has impacted people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, as well as the policy and practice responses during this quite extraordinary year. I urge you to register for the conference. The program is growing every day and, and promises a really robust symposium of voices from Australia and internationally as well. And a quick reminder that we would appreciate your feedback by completing the short survey that will arrive in your inbox today, may have already done so, um, you may want to share this webinar with your colleagues. It will be on our website in the next few days. Um, and so until we see you again in person, thank you for joining us today.